Jared Taylor, what are some of the most dangerous myths in American society today? Wow, where do I begin? Gosh, there's so many. Uh, you know, there is a whole host of beliefs in the United States today that I would categorize as so obviously wrong and stupid that only very, very intelligent people could persuade themselves that they're true. And one of them, I would say, is the idea that diversity is a great gift for America. Diversity of the kind we're all supposed to be celebrating, whether it's uh, religious or racial or linguistic or cultural, all of that, they are sources of tension and conflict all around the world, wherever you look. People are slaughtering each other with great diligence because diverse people are trying to share the same territory. And for us to think that that's a strength of the United States, it's completely cuckoo. I'd say another one is the notion that race doesn't really exist. That when you see a black person and an Asian person, that's, that's some sort of sociological optical illusion, that that doesn't really exist. Race doesn't exist. Everybody knows race exists. People behave on the basis of race all the time, but we're supposed to pretend it doesn't exist. Oh, another one would be that uh, uh, oh, men and women are basically the same nature, that the only reason we're different is because we're socialized differently. I, I remember this uh, great story of uh, uh, some feminist trying to raise a boy not to be militant in any way, no trucks, no guns. He'd pick up a banana and go pow, pow, pow with a banana. Is that enough for you? Dangerous, crazy myths. You know. What would you say are the implications of these things? What oh, would you boy. say are the, the policy consequences of believing in these myths? Right. Well, the whole notion of diversity, the notion that if you fill the United States with people as unlike each other as possible, that that is somehow going to produce a great nation, that's very dangerous. And it is particularly not just dangerous but unfortunate for whites, the people who built and established this nation. Whites are supposed to celebrate diversity. What does that mean? They're supposed to celebrate their dwindling numbers and their dwindling influence. It's not as though you can fill the country with Haitians and Guatemalans and turn them into the, the moral heirs of Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. It's simply not going to happen. When people come to the United States from the third world, they're not arriving with the idea of presenting us with this precious gift of diversity. They never heard of diversity before they came here. What they're coming for is to get a first world income. But they want to live their previous life, their previous folk ways, language, culture, religion, with a first world income. They don't want to become like me. They have no interest in becoming Western the way we are. And so the idea that you get all these people from all around the world, and we're going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya and live happily ever after, crazy, and it will reduce whites to a minority. Frankly, I don't want to be a minority. I don't want my grandchildren to be minorities. So the implications are bad for the country as a whole because diversity is a source of conflict, and they're particularly bad for whites because they will be reduced to a minority in which they are likely to be a despised remnant. All of this story about how whites oppressed the third world, how they oppressed and enslaved blacks, they're not going to stop talking about that. Not at all. No, I won't want to be here 100 years from now if current trends continue. Are you saying that when whites become a minority, they might be treated differently than the way whites had treated the minorities? I think, as a matter of fact, this may be a very unfashionable thing to say, but if you look at American history of the last 50 years, whites have treated minorities with the kind of munificence and a kind of generosity that is unprecedented in the history of the world. Whites are still the majority in this country, and yet, Whites have instituted institutions that discriminate against their own people. If you want to apply to an Ivy League college or even to a state university or a community college, do you think you're better off being a white male or a black female? Everybody knows the answer to that question. And that is why whites are still a majority. And this kind of unfairness is something that legislatures State and federal have been utterly incapable of abolishing. The only way to get rid of that kind of racial preference has been through state ballot initiatives. And how do these initiatives turn out? Blacks and Hispanics vote in overwhelming numbers to keep those preferences. And why not? 
Well, when they become a majority, do you think they're suddenly going to think, gee, this is just not fair to those wicked white racists who oppressed us all those hundreds of years? No. Once they become a majority, what's going to happen to the white minority? No, I think that I'm not worried. If I were, if I were expecting the coming non-white majority to treat whites the way whites have treated non-whites for the last 50 years, I'd say go right ahead. Not going to happen. I would say that there are really two possibilities. If whites continue to be, continue to sleepwalk in this browbeaten, bamboozled state in which they think that anything that they do to preserve a white majority or to promote their own interests, if they continue to think that that's somehow wrong, then the United States will become like Brazil. It'll be a nation in which there is a small number of people who live in gated communities and they helicopter from their gated communities to their gated swim clubs and to their gated schools, while the rest of the sort of brown and black mass below is seething and bubbling. I can imagine the United States turning into a Brazil of that kind. On the other hand, if whites wake up to the fact that they face a real crisis, that their civilization, their continuation as a people a distinct people, the distinct culture, that existence is at stake. They may do something about that and preserve at least part of the United States or some system in which they can affirm themselves as a majority people and culture. I think it is one of those two. And uh, I think you can imagine which is the one that I would prefer for the United States. I don't want my descendants to be living in Brazil. I want them to be living in some country in which they can be proud of their ancestors, proud of their culture, and that they live in a society that reflects that culture, not some sort of crazy mishmash where everything from all around the world has come in a sort of a mutually in uncomprehending, perpetually hostile state, which is what I think we will end up with unless whites wake up. Mr. Taylor, you're an eloquent speaker. What would you say to someone that said, all of these $5 words are just a way of hiding a deep-seated racism? <laughs> um, well, I might not be entirely eloquent in my reply, <laughs> but if I, if I chose to uh, maintain a certain civility, I would say, okay, you're calling me basically a racist. What you're doing is you're calling me a name. And when you're reduced to name calling, that's the most graceless way of admitting you've lost the argument.